I want to introduce this press conference with a little explanation about what we stand for, what we mean by re resistance or admonishment, and what we don't mean. We're deadly serious, and this is the beginning of a long process because the Catholic Church is in crisis. So I will just read a, an introduction, putting this in the right context, and then we will each take turns with the five-minute intervention, and then we'll take questions from members of the press. My name is Michael Matt. I'm a cradle Catholic, educated in Catholic schools from the first grade through university. I'm also the father of seven children, all practicing Catholics. I have attended diocesan approved traditional Latin masses for the past 30 years. I'm a Catholic newspaper publisher and I come from a long line of Catholic newspaper publishers. For 150 years, my family has been in the Catholic press apostolate, defending the church against aggressors on all sides. Our family newspaper, The Wanderer, is the oldest Catholic weekly newspaper in the United States. And The Remnant is the oldest traditional Catholic newspaper in the world. For his work in the American Catholic press, my grandfather was made a Knight of St. Gregory by His Holiness Pope Pius XI. So when I say that I'm a faithful Catholic, especially members of the non-Catholic press, when I say that I'm a faithful Catholic, I am speaking for myself, my father, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather, all Catholic men of the press who devoted their lives to the defense of the Catholic Church. I do not sit up here without forethought, prayer, and serious consideration, because this is a serious moment in our church's history. And I would like to introduce this press conference then with full, full dis disclosure because there has been a degree of controversy. The language in the press release that was sent out that caused some consternation in the press is mine and mine alone, and I do not retract any of it. If the members of the press who attacked this conference based solely on our press release and then went on to attack Bishop Zubik of the Diocese of, of Pittsburgh, and then went on to attack a church full of families, elderly, old and young, Catholic Church, most precious blood. These had nothing to do with that press release or this press conference. And I believe the members of the press, if they are professional journalists, are aware of this. So why they took it upon themselves to attack a Catholic church that had nothing to do with any of this is beyond me, but it speaks to their, possibly, to their motivations. And if they are sincerely concerned for our souls, if we are guilty of the mortal sin of schism, which is what schism is, a mortal sin, if we are guilty of that sin, might I suggest that these so-called media journalists ask the more pertinent question, which is, why have faithful Catholics at the Catholic Identity Conference found themselves in this embarrassing and ridiculous position of having to resist members of our own church? We are proud Catholics. Do you think we enjoy facing our Protestant neighbors when we're in the media having to resist our own church? Do you think we would go into this lightly? or if we didn't absolutely have to do it, obligated in conscience to do so. As members of the press, why are these not asking the more pressing question of how did it come to be that lay Catholics catechized and raised in the Catholic schools and nevertheless find themselves scandalized by their own shepherds? We do not enjoy being in this position. We have not created this scandal. And members of the Catholic press know that full well because the headlines all across the world of the scandal, the sex scandal, the financial scandals in the Vatican are not, are, are not difficult to find. They know the Catholic Church is in crisis and yet they attack us for taking a principled stand against what is happening. The question that should be asked by members of the Catholic press is why have the Catholic shepherds not felt an obligation before God to address the cause of our scandal, scandal among the sheep, which is all we are, fathers, lay Catholics. We are not theologians. We are mothers and fathers, simple Catholics 
who have never missed mass on Sunday, who were educated in Catholic schools, and who today do not recognize our own church. Why are we being blamed for being scandalized by these shepherds? Over the course of the next hour, the three of us will be speaking for our own respective organizations, and I would like to thank sincerely all those associated with the Catholic Identity Conference, especially Eric Frankovich, for having the courage to allow this press conference to take place despite the controversy, and it was significant, significant yesterday, the controversy in the press during the run-up to this conference. The Catholic Identity Conference has not backed down and neither will we. We speak for ourselves and not for any other speakers on this roster. But each of us believes the Catholic Church has reached a crisis unprecedented in history. And we present our articles of resistance as lay Catholics who have no intention of leaving the Catholic Church now or ever. We feel obligated in, con in conscience and before God to raise these objections for the good of the church in crisis. So in this moment of synodality, and I stress this, synodality, when the church, the hierarchy, the bishops, starting with the pope, are speaking about listening to the world, listening to the Catholics who happen to have still s remained in the church, the most dumbed down Catholics, not their fault in history because of what has happened in Catholic schools, they're listening to these poor Catholics who have been abandoned by the church of accompaniment. And when these poor undereducated Catholics say they want changes with respect to the church's teaching on gay marriage and abortion and contraception, well, then the bishops will say, yes, we're listening to the people and we're going to make these changes. This is what we fear is going to happen next year when the Synod on Synodality finally meets. But speaking of synodality, when the Vatican is engaging in a listening campaign across the world, we wish to make it clear to the members of the press that nobody in the Vatican seems interested at all in listening to us. Despite the fact, as I just said, we are faithful Catholics who never even miss Mass on Sundays. Because the Catholic priests and nuns in Catholic school taught us that was a mortal sin to miss Mass on Sunday. Does the church still hold to this? If she does, she speaks nary a word about it. But in this spirit of synodality that they're asking us to buy into, we would point out that no one has asked our priests for their input, for example, before the decision was made to severely restrict the Latin Mass to which we are all attached and which has provided spiritual sustenance for our little children all of their lives and they're taking it away from us. Why? If the bishops truly wish to listen to us as faithful Catholics who have not departed one iota from the apostolic tradition of the church, then we have no other recourse than to acknowledge their callous disregard for us and for our children and for our communities and to resist their campaign to cancel our rightful liturgical aspirations in accordance with His Holiness Pope Benedict XVI motu proprio sumorum pontificum. The use of the term resist is taken directly from Holy Scripture, Galatians 2.11, wherein St. Paul resisted Peter to his face because he was blameworthy. But note this, St. Paul did not hate Peter, nor did St. Paul deny Peter's Petrine office. St. Paul was not committing a schismatic act, and neither are we. We resist Francis honorably, filially, charitably, to his face as loyal sons of the church re resist an abusive father. We neither, judge, we neither judge nor condemn him, and we place our filial resistance in the context of the teaching of St. Robert Bellarmine, doctor of the church, who in his On the Sovereign Pontiff writes the following. Therefore, just as it would be lawful to resist a pontiff invading the body, 
so it is lawful to resist him invading souls or disturbing the state, and much more if he should endeavor to destroy the church. I say it is lawful to resist him, but not by not doing what he commands and by blocking him, lest he should carry out his will. You are all familiar with the first part of that quotation. Allow me to finish that quotation from Robert Bellarmine, St. Robert Bellarmine. The rest of it reads, quote, still, it is not lawful to judge or punish or even to depose him because he is nothing other than a superior. Ladies and gentlemen, we do not judge the Pope. We do not seek to depose him, even if we had it within our power to do so. But yes, before God and history, we resist his agenda on the grounds that it does harm to Mother Church of Jesus Christ, a fact we believe to be demonstrably, demonstrably obvious as the following interventions will make clear. Eric Frankovich will present now our first intervention on, of resistance. The second will be by John Henry Weston, and I will close out representing Remnant Newspaper. Eric, the podium is yours. As president of the Catholic Identity Conference, I'm here to defend the right of faithful Catholics to resist Pope Francis's unjust order to severely restrict assets to the Latin Mass worldwide. We respectfully raise this objection on the grounds that there is a false premise at the heart of this motu proprio, traditionalis custodes, and in the Holy Father's accompanying letter. Pope Francis claims to be, quote, saddened that the use of the Roman Missal of 1962 is often characterized by a rejection not only of the liturgical reform, but of the Vatican Council itself and that as a result of this alleged rejection of the new mass, the Latin mass must be severely restricted in the name of protecting unity within the Catholic community worldwide. However, the facts tell a different story. While traditional Catholics remain in the church, subject to the Roman, Roman pontiff, and obedient to the church's laws and precepts, the vast majority of non-traditional Catholics have abandoned the practice of faith altogether. A recent survey of the United States, for example, found that just 17 million out of 73 million registered Catholics attend obligatory mass on Sundays and Holy Days. That is, 80% of all American registered Catholics have already rejected the Reformed Liturgy of Vatican II. The fact that Francis has nevertheless determined to restrict the Latin Mass and in effect punish those Catholics who have remained faithful suggests a discriminatory, discriminatory bias on his part against tradition itself. Furthermore, we invite the press to take note of the fact that the vast majority of so-called traditional Catholics today attend masses celebrated by a diocesan Catholic priest who also offer the new mass. Therefore, far from disrupting unity within the church, a substantial majority of traditional Catholics, in cooperation with their diocesan pastors, and under the provisions of Samorum Pontificum, provide one of the most unique examples of unity, mutual liturgical enrichment, and bridge building in the Catholic Church today. To summarize, in accordance with the motu proprio Samorum Pontificum, issued by Pope Benedict XVI in 2007, traditional Catholics have remained faithful to the Catholic praxis by remaining in the Church, while 80% of mainstream Catholics who attend the new Mass have since rejected that Mass out of hand and abandoned it altogether. We believe that Pope Francis's prejudicial bias against the rightful liturgical aspirations of traditional Catholics constitutes a violation of natural justice that rises to the level of religious discrimination against traditional Catholics. We loyal sons and daughters of the Church nevertheless pray for the Pope Francis by name at every traditional Latin Mass without fail even though we feel duty-bound in conscience to publicly resist his unjust actions against the traditional Latin Mass, specifically in the Catholic tradition in general.
Thank you. To the participants here, I might apologize for the repetitive nature of this, but to the press, <coughs> this is John Henry Weston for LifeSite News, and I want to just tell you that I'm going to present some things here about Pope Francis for why we believe faithful Catholics actually have a duty before God to resist the attempts by globalists, the Vatican, even the Pope himself to undermine Define dogma on moral questions, which is really what we deal with at LifeSite News, particularly around life and family issues. So from the very first moment of his pontificate, there was scandal. On the balcony with Pope Francis, with that tiny number of the College of Cardinals selected by the Pope to accompany him onto the balcony at his proclamation, was none other than Cardinal Daniel, a cardinal known to be dissident on abortion having encouraged the King of Belgium to sign a pro-abortion law. He supported gay marriage and wore the rainbow stole. And if that isn't bad enough, he is the only cardinal caught on tape encouraging a victim of pedophile, incestuous sexual abuse not to report the abuse to authorities. On day three, the Pope praised the heretic Cardinal Walter Casper for doing theology on the knees. He banished Cardinals Burke, Sarah, and Müller. He banished the Franciscan Friars of the Immaculate, the order of priests who were responsible for offering more traditional Latin masses than any other order apart from the fraternity of St. Peter itself. He publicly praised Italy's leading abortionist Emma Bonino and met with her so much that this former illegal abortionist turned politician and champion of abortion now speaks at Catholic churches. He endorsed the UN Sustainable Development Goals, number 3.7 of which promotes abortion via the UN code words of universal access to sexual and reproductive health care and services. In 2015, he invited a transgender couple to the Vatican and called the two females, one of whom had mutilated herself to appear as a man, married and happy. He referred to the mutilated woman as he that was her but is he thus surrendering the pronoun wars. Under Pope Francis, the Church did a 180-degree about-face on population control, whereas Pope John Paul II called the pro-life movement to fight depopulation at the United Nations. Pope Francis made the biggest population control advocates like Jeffrey Sachs, Paul Ehrlich, and Ban Ki-moon speakers at the Vatican itself. On July 16, 2016, he called cohabitation real marriage that had the grace of real marriage when referring to some northern, Argenti in northern Ar Argentina who felt they were monogamous in their sexual relations. He committed what can only be called idolatry with the Pachamama scandal and continued it in Canada recently with the native shaman invoking one of the four directions to open the sacred circle of spirits to join them there while Pope Francis and the attending cardinals all participated in the pagan ceremony with eyes closed and hands held reverently on their hearts. Pope Francis was asked about avoiding pregnancy in areas <coughs> where Zika virus was prevalent. And he noted that contraception was not an absolute evil. Asked for clarification, the Vatican confirmed that Pope Francis was approving the use of contraceptives and condoms in grave cases. And in case that wasn't clear enough, the Pope has now permitted the so-called Pontifical Academy for Life to openly suggest a change to the Church's perennial teaching against contraception. But you know, some people might say that these are not official documents. The Church uh, of the church. They don't actually represent anything magisterial and they can be ignored. Well, not so fast. First, there is a Morris Laetitia. And even when some tried to do mental gymnastics to interpret a Morris Laetitia or in an orthodox fashion, Pope Francis made the heretical interpretation allowing for communion for divorced and remarried couples the official interpretation. And then, 
In a rather little-known passage in his 2018 exhortation called Gaudete et Exultate, Pope Francis teaches the opposite of what Popes John Paul II and Benedict XVI taught regarding the preeminence of abortion as an issue of moral concern. Speaking of immigration and abortion, but of immigration, he said, and I quote, this is a quote from the exhortation Gaudete in, in, uh, et Exultate. Some Catholics consider it a secondary issue compared to the grave bioethical questions. He continued, that a politician looking for votes might say such a thing is understandable, but not a Christian. He criticized those who relativize these issues as if there are other more important matters or the only thing that counts is the one particular ethical issue or cause that they themselves defend. An absolute direct attack on pro-life Catholics. And in the latest apostolic letter, Desiderio Desideravi, that addresses Holy Communion, the Pope said that all that was needed for the reception of Holy Communion is faith. That document was released on June 29th, the very day on which the most pro-abortion U.S. so-called Catholic politician in history, Nancy Pelosi, came to the Vatican and visited with Pope Francis and received communion at a papal mass. This must be seen against the background of Pelosi's bishop, Archbishop Corleone, publicly issuing a decree noting that she must be denied Holy Communion after a decade of trying to convince her to amend her ways. The Pope openly bashed Pelosi's Archbishop, Salvatore Corleone, as, as lacking a pastoral nature. So just recently, Tyler, Texas Bishop Joseph Strickland, Kazakhstan Auxiliary Bishop Athanasius Schneider, Dutch Bishop Robert Mutzatz, and retired Texas Bishop Rene Grisida have issued a document on the apostolic letter citing it for, and I quote, contradicting the faith and quoting the Catechism of the Council of Trent, which calls the notion put forward by Pope Francis in his letter heresy. Shall we not then join with these heroic bishops and the many learned priests, religious and laity who have begun to resist Pope Francis? In truth, if we care about the faith, if we care about the faith of our children, and truly if we care about the soul of Pope Francis, we must resist. And you know, at LifeSight we pray every single day. All of LifeSight prays every single day for the conversion of Pope Francis, for Pope Francis and Pope Benedict. Please join us in that prayer. And our position is one of love, love for Pope Francis, love for the church, and love for our children, for whom we will resist this agenda to destroy the faith. Final uh, interjection then is from I represent the remnant. I present this article of resistance based on Pope Francis's well-known participation in the globalist project of world governance based on a Christophobic new political order. This intervention comes with a warning to those bishops and priests who perhaps have not been studying what's happening at Davos, Switzerland, the World <coughs> Economic Forum. But if, as some are concerned, if the synod on synodality should green light gay unions on some level, which seems likely, please God, may it not happen. But if it does happen, you will not have to be a traditional Catholic to find yourself on the wrong side of the law in the future. If you're a traditional Catholic, if you're a Catholic priest, a Catholic bishop, and you refuse to bless these unions, you will be guilty of hate speech. You will be guilty of hate crime, perhaps, and it's going to become very dangerous for us all. So we're not just speaking on behalf of traditional Catholics, we're talking about all Catholics, when the teaching of our church is going to be considered a hate crime. So the fact that Francis has lent the moral authority of the Catholic Church to the Globalist Project 
is not some loony conspiracy theory, and I think everybody knows that. They like to say that it's a conspiracy theory at YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, but everyone knows it's completely out in the open. Francis has publicly partnered with globalist entities on multiple fronts, despite their well-documented promotion of so-called reproductive rights, contraception, and abortion to lower the Earth's population and save the Earth from the planetary crisis. Take, for example, Professor Jeffrey Sachs of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University, who apart from co-authoring the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, is also an outspoken proponent of contraception. And yes, we have the video. Francis appointed Sachs to the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences as special advisor to the Holy See, despite Jeffrey Sachs's public support of the campaign to lower the world's population through contraception, a top priority of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Speaking at a Vatican workshop on the Global <coughs> Education Pact, hosted by the Pontifical Academy of Sciences on February 6 and 7, 2020, Jeffrey Sachs announced that potential funding partners for Pope Francis's May 2020 Global Education Pact to create a new humanism, those partners include Bill Gates, funding Vatican projects. Bill Gates Foundation is one of the most powerful promoters of contraception in the world today. Given the Catholic Church's moral theology on current moral theology and current catechisms of the Catholic Church against artificial contraception, this is a scandal. In addition, Pope Francis blessed and approved the worldwide COVID lockdown, which has caused incalculable damage to people and nations all over the world and led to an economic crisis that puts millions out of work, closed nearly every Catholic church, every church in the world, left elderly to die in nursing homes without access to their priests, family, last rites, and they set children, this lockdown has set children back years in their education due to the school closures. It also subjected the entire world to an essentially mandatory vaccination campaign, a vaccine that is tainted with the dead bodies of aborted babies, the parts. The lockdown was promoted by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the United Nations, George Soros' Open Society Foundation, the Vatican, the World Bank, and the World Economic Forum. The latter, having since come under intense media criticism on the right, and even in the center to some degree, for its stated plan to use the COVID pandemic to reset the world in line with the fourth industrial revolution of the World Economic Forum, founded by Klaus Schwab, a man who advocates a new global governance, transhumanism, the fusion of our digital and genetic and biological identities, if you can believe it, population control, under the skin surveillance, the digital ID framework, and the environmental, social, and corporate gov governance, the so-called ESGs, which guarantee that if you own a business or a corporation, if you're in a corporation that is pro-life, you will not get the funding you need to go on. Pope Francis has sent his personal greetings to the World Economic Forum, their annual meeting at Davos in Switzerland every year, not just in 2020 when people first started learning about Davos. This has been a project and work, works for a long time. He's been sending it every year since 2014, and in 2020, Pope Francis sent Cardinal Peter Turkson to personally deliver the Pope's papal blessing on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the World Economic Forum, which at this moment is promising to lock down the world. Francis has endorsed key elements of the World Economic Forum's Great Reset as well, ranging from calling upon the world to eat less meat and in accord with what Bill Gates is trying to do, get rid of cows, get rid of meat. Francis has called on the world now to eat less meat, to drive electric cars, to reduce air conditioning use, etc. all in the name of reaching the sustainable development goals of the United Nations by the year 2030, which also promote contraception, as John Henry Weston just noted, and abortion. 
The Vatican under Francis has become a proponent of global vaccination as well, with Pope Francis asserting that it is a matter of Christian charity to force even children who are in no statistical threat of COVID to force them to be vaccinated. Francis has frequently joined his voice to that of Joe Biden, Bill Gates, George Soros, and Klaus Schwab in asserting that the climate emergency is an existential threat and thus the greatest threat to humanity in the world today. This, even as the Catholic Church falls into unprecedented collapse, crisis, and scandal worldwide. The Diocese of Madison, Wisconsin, for example, has just last week announced, has become the latest to announce massive parish reduction the church and church closings in the post-COVID period. Madison is an example of dioceses all across the United States. Madison will be closing 70 of its 102 churches since only 32,000 Catholics in Wisconsin out of 138 registered Catholics in Madison Diocese attend Mass on Sunday anymore. This is a widespread phenomenon all throughout America, Canada, Europe, you know the drill. And yet Francis says climate change is the greatest threat we face. In France, Hakim El Karoui, President Emmanuel Macron, his advisor on Islam, announced that Islam is now the most practiced religion in Catholic faith, in, in, in Catholic France. And I assert once again, this has nothing to do with Islamophobia. <coughs> the Muslims are simply taking over where the Catholics have abandoned their church. Only two new churches were built in France over the past 10 years, while one new mosque is set up in France every 15 days. Meanwhile, arson against Catholic churches in France is at all time high and has left the church in France literally burning. And yet Francis says climate change is the greatest threat we face. His encyclical letter Laudato Si on climate change has been vigorously promoted by pro-gay marriage activists and entertainers such as Bono, population control experts such as Jeffrey Sachs, Greta Thunberg, with whom Francis met personally, and we have video of Francis encouraging that poor child to continue her great work. And UN Secretaries Ban Ki-moon and now Antonio Guterres refer in, reveren in reverential tones to Laudato Si, almost as though it's the Magna Carta of the environmental movement a movement which is beginning to influence politicians and corporations to lock down the world once again in the name of going green to save the planet. Furthermore, the Amazon Synod of 2019 made it clear that Francis has adopted the inclusion and equity model and rhetoric of Klaus Schwab, a ruse being used to tear down the old order of Christendom, European Christians in the name of Christ, holy Christendom, to tear that order down, whom they create, whom they label as racists, of course, and to build back better according to an inclusive new order in the name of human fraternity. Jesus Christ is left out completely. I was in Rome during the Amazon Synod, and it was not just us, it was not just traditional Catholics who were scandalized, who resisted Francis and the unfolding globalist agenda that we saw during that schism. Cardinals Burke and Brand Mueller sent letters to the College of Cardinals warning of apostasy and heresy at the Amazon Synod. Cardinal Burke and Bishop Athanasius Schneider issued an eight-page declaration warning against six serious theological errors and heresy in the working document of that synod. But the situation has only gotten much worse since then. Two weeks ago in Kazakhstan, Pope Francis joined ecumenical and political leaders in signing a document stating that, quote, pluralism and differences in religion are expressions of the wisdom of God's will in creation, thus conveying the impression that the Holy Father has canceled the church's dogmatic teaching that she is the sole means of salvation. Thank God resistance was raised to this document and a slightly edited version was released, although not many people heard about that. The scandal is already done. After Abu Dhabi, Pope Francis informed the world that the God of surprises wants a brotherhood of religions. 
This is in contradiction to the divine commission of our Lord himself, who ordered the successors of the apostles to baptize all nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. But very much in line is this statement of Abu Dhabi with the globalist agenda to equalize all religions, to criminalize religious supremacism, which is how they refer to Catholicism, religious supremacism, and to set up some sort of one world religion based on the brotherhood of man. As part of the globalist push for that one world religion in Lund, Sweden, Francis met with Lutheran, Lutherans pretending to be bishops in a cathedral stolen from Mother Church and prayed with them in commemoration of the Protestant revolt, which tore Christendom in half. How is this not in direct contradiction to the teachings of Pope Pius XI and Mortalium Animos, which condemned such pan-Christian gatherings? We see one Pope pitted against another. And as laymen, we have, to, we have a choice to make. As we see it, unless and until these and so many other questions are answered, it is not our fault that Popes are turning against their predecessors that cardinals are against cardinals, that bishops are turning against bishops, that priests are against priests. It is not our fault. But unless and until these answers and these contradictions are answered, are given satisfaction, we have no choice but to remain faithful to the traditional teachings of the church as reiterated by the constant teaching authority of the magisterium of the Catholic Church. As we see it, and less than until, as far as Pope Francis is concerned, we are rigid and fanatical and pharisaical, pharisaical for practicing the faith of our fathers as it was handed down to us. We've invented nothing. We do not rely on our opinion. We rely on the teaching authority of the church. But if it is true that we are rigid, fanatical, and pharisaical for doing so, and so too were the 260 popes, Francis's own predecessors, rigid, fanatical, and pharisaical. We pray for Francis every day, but we are also bound in conscience before the dread judgment seat of God himself to resist Francis, to resist his novel teachings and his public alliance with those who deny the very existence of Christ the King, those who would lock down the world in the name of climate change, close the churches and enslave humanity in a global surveillance super state where God is not allowed. This is not us theorizing. This is exactly what Francis's friends in Davos have been broadcasting to the world for 50 years, but especially since 2020. And I conclude by making a statement paraphrased from Pope St. Pius X, that the true friends of the Pope are neither revolutionaries nor innovators. The true friends of the Pope are traditionalists who are not afraid to raise our voices loyally, filially, as sons who have been abandoned, to raise our voices against what is happening to our mother, to our church. So we beg the Holy Father to listen to the cries of his scattered sheep, us, and become the shepherd to us once again, to bring Mother Church back. But until that happens, we as his most loyal subjects have no alternative but to resist Francis to his face for the sake of the church and the salvation of souls, including and especially the soul of Pope Francis. Thank you very much. If there are any questions at this point, we have a few minutes to answer. Anybody has any? 
Timothy Flanders from 1 Peter 5, one of the most common ideas among non-Catholics is that Catholics obey the Pope. That's what we do. In fact, Bishop Burbage recently in August said in his statement in the tradition that fidelity and loyalty to the Holy Father is who we are as Catholics. So how do you respond to this confusion? We respond simply with we don't know. This is the most confusing thing. And again, uh, in my talk today, I said, I'm no theologian. This is insanity. This doesn't make any sense. I remember I used to do apologetics when I, I was uh, younger. My, my, my wife was, was uh, evangelical Protestant. I remember saying to her, show me one time the church has ever in her 2,000 year history changes teaching and I will become a Protestant. It's very similar to the, the statement, you know, if somebody wants ketchup with their fries and you say, well, is the Pope Catholic? This is bizarre. No one's saying that anymore because we're the most confusing time. But we're also fathers. We can't help but defend the faith of our children. If Pope Francis were a pastor in a church, and he invited Father James Martin to come preach next Sunday. And he told us cohabitation is real marriage and has the grace of real marriage. And he told us that in some cases, in grave circumstances, contraceptive could be allowed. And he told us that divorced and remarried Catholics could now come and receive Holy Communion. And he told us that, well, population control really is probably needed. We would leave the parish. We wouldn't hate the pastor. We would tell our kids to pray for the pastor because the pastor needs help. That's what we have to do. We're simple. I'm no theologian, but I am a dad of eight children and I will defend their faith. Okay. I, think I, would, I would add to that uh, just very briefly that um, our, as I said, our, our, our confidence in what we're saying and doing has absolutely nothing to do with us. I didn't give you a single bit of opinion. None of us were sharing our opinion. We're, where we get confidence to speak at a time like this is in the constant magisterial teachings of the church. And when you see a departure from the constant magister magisterial teachings of the church, as we, lay, as we laid out this weekend, you don't even have the right to go along with the novelty. You have to stay with what is established, what is traditional, what is true, and what you were taught. So Pope Francis has not ordered me to do anything. He has unleashed a, 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 a slew of, of novelties and confusion that pretty much take us off the hooks as the lay faithful Catholic fathers, dads, because it's just too much. And we can point at the catechism and say, this is what the church teaches. This is a novelty that Francis is offering. And until it's resolved, we have to stay with what is sure. And that's the faith, because the faith trumps everything else. The, the, the law of faith is the most important thing. And that's why. That's it's precisely and exactly why we raise this resistance, so that we will have assistance in having these answered for us at the If I can add, so everything that's been brought up and all these issues that have, that have occurred, we believe we are being faithful and loyal to the Pope by raising these issues, by calling them to his attention and to the attention of other Catholics, that these are very serious problems. And we have an obligation to bring it up to the Pope and bring it up to the, those in authority so that they know that there is this resistance because it's absolutely is contrary to prior Catholic teaching. Matt Gaspers, Catholic Family News. First of all, thank you all so much for those wonderful interventions. I'm, I'm proud and honored to be a brother in arms with you all. Thank you. So my question is in regard to, you know, we as the laity are called to publicly resist, but where are the bishops, where are the cardinals who should be doing this? That's my question. And the Code of Canon, I just want to read from the Code of Canon Law, Canon 349 says that the cardinals assist the Roman pontiff either collegially when they are convoked to deal with questions of major importance, or individually when they help the Roman pontiff through the various offices they perform especially in the daily care of the universal church. So as we all know, 
Uh, Cardinal Raymond Byrd, for example, who's done much good, also promised us, I believe it was at the end of 2016, for a formal correction of the objectively heretical statements in Amoris Laetitia. Respectfully, where is the formal correction? Where are the cardinals calling out the Pope? When are, what is it going to take for them to resist him to the face as you have done? That's my question. Uh, I, would, I would say specifically, thanks for the question, and I would say specifically with Cardinal Burke, um, there's a, and I know you know this, Matt, but I'm just going to throw it out to the larger audience. There's a, a, a world of difference between what a, a cardinal can do and should do and what a layman like layman like us can and, sh and should do. I would say that uh, we have an, a tremendous debt of gratitude to Cardinal Burke for having brought this to the attention of the whole world. It reminds me a little bit of what our Swiss of Vigano did where he brought the, the scandal to the attention of the whole world. Cardinal Burke then called for this nubia for the, for the, to be answered. And I almost feel like he's that the world is aware now, the whole the silence kind of gives consent from Francis, the silence that Cardinal Burke has received. And so I, I don't know, I understand some people who are very frustrated, like, why won't Cardinal Burke demand more? Not just him, the, whole the whole college, yeah. And I would say that, 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 that this is a vicious situation in the Vatican right now. And I think there are those who are trying to get in positions where they might be able to influence the next conclave, knowing that this one is pretty much hopeless, humanly speaking, and I think that could be part of what's at play. I don't intend to in any way speak for Cardinal Burke. I only wish to say that as a journalist, I really appreciate the fact that he opened all of this up so that we could sort of point to Cardinal Burke as the one who brought this to the attention of the world and sort of do our part as laymen to say even more, Francis, you need to answer them, put the pressure, continue to pressure. I would also say just briefly in, in answer to your first part of your question, I think we are going to see many more bishops that are moving in the direction. This is why I wanted to stress that the situation with Davos, the World Economic Forum, you don't have to be a traditional Catholic to be very, very, very concerned about what those men are planning for us. We just got locked down for two years. These men want to start it up again. And, and, and very soon, if they can get away with it, only this time it'll be about climate change, saving the planet. I believe, and I think we need to encourage and communicate with the Stricklands, with the good bishops of the world, who are very much aware now of where this is going, how Christophobic this actually is, anticipating that they're not used to this. They're not fighters in that sense. Collegiality has shackled them to, to, to their own and to each other for 50 years. So this is very new territory to them, to them for them. So I would encourage us to really be uh, mindful, pray for them, of course, but also be mindful that they're going to start coming, they're going to come start coming over to our camps out of sheer necessity because of the diabolical nature. Now, it's not just old mass, mass versus new mass. The diabolical nature of where this globalist revolution is going to which Francis is connected. So I, I share your frustration. I am also pretty happy that we have a lot more. When I was a kid, there was one. <laughs> you know, now we have a, a, many more than one. We have, we have three at this conference. Thank God for them and pray for them. Don't expect them to resist in the same way that we do because they're bishops, or they're, they're, they're uh, princes of the church, but they have their contacts. So we have a beautiful moment here of hope that these bishops who are speaking out are also connected to a lot of other bishops around the world and let's anticipate. And then as laymen, do whatever we can to possibly pray for them and encourage them lovingly to come in this direction. I just might add to that. Um, it is sad to see that there is not that speaking out for the faithful. There was not for so long. There were the questions. There was no formal correction. And I think people thought in the beginning, because the dubia were submitted before, and when things happened, when it became official, we thought, oh, that's when it'll happen. When divorce, remarried, communion would become teaching reality would happen. But then people started to do, oh, well, it doesn't really mean that. It could mean this other. But then when it was official, official in the Acta Apostolica Series, where it was like, absolutely, this is the interpretation. We thought then, but no. All the different statements, seeker virus, cohabitation, all this stuff, we thought then, but no, there were only statements, maybe not official documents. But when the official documents showed up, then what? And still nothing. But you know, just like in the situation with Mark Houck, the suffering of his little kids when raided by the FBI, even though the FBI has known to have been corrupt, sorry, it should have been for a long, long time. 
the Hunter Biden laptop, the raid on David Lydon, the raid on Joan Andrews Bell, Trump and Mike Lindell. I mean, come on, should have been known. But you know what? The sufferings of those little kids, we'll get to it. You know what the wake up call is in the church? The traditional mass. That's where we will feel it. That's where all of the children and the young people are going to feel it because they're the ones filling those churches. And when that gets shut, when that gets shut down as it is being right now, the clamor will become unbearable. That's why you've already seen Cardinals Burke, Zen, Miller, Brandt Miller, even Bo say publicly that the shutdown of this Latin mass is not the way to go. We haven't heard anything big formal yet, but there's been comments. So there is some resistance. I do believe there's fear. Uh, they're afraid of retribution. Um, clearly, when a bishop turns 75 and he's conservative, he's out immediately. If you're a liberal bishop, they're left in place for as long as they're able to function. Perhaps, and I hope, if this new synod occurs as it's supposed to, there will be serious reflection by these bishops and, and cardinals, and it may give them enough fortitude to, to finally react and finally do something about it. So that's the hope. Hi, Kennedy Hall with LifeSite News. Um, one man who I know is sort of a patron of this but hasn't been mentioned is Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. And I remember watching that old uh, debate that I think you hosted, Mike, uh, with Michael Davies. And he said, along came a man by God, and his name was Marcel Lefebvre, referring to his resistance. In this age where everyone's canonized, for one, maybe we should start calling him Saint Marcel. But has he finally been vindicated? Is this the moment where all the controversy, all the dust has been settled, and we see, I think he had a point. I, uh, I always, I always uh, it's never, it's never right. My mother told me never, never to brag. And, and I know it's always, it's a sin to do so, but I'd never miss an opportunity to brag that I was, I received the sacrament of confirmation from Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, one of the crowning, uh, you know, uh, uh, honors of my life, even though I was a child. Um, I, if I had, I guess we can say what we all want to say about Archbishop Lefebvre, and that's fine. I think you and I agree on, on Lefebvre. Was he vindicated? Duh. <laughs> And, and, I, and I, if I would say one thing to my friends in the Society of St. Pius X, I think their PR machine should start promoting that more and more and more that Archbishop Lefebvre was absolutely right um, to, to do what he did. And, and again, he gives us a, a beautiful picture of resistance. I get so upset with people who want to make him into a bomb-throwing nutjob renegade that would be sitting here calling Francis Franken-Pope or whatever and you know, having a good time. If people are having too much fun Throwing stuff at Francis is always kind of a concern for me. Now, now Lefebvre, who I remember, even though I was a child, uh, did not do that. Every time he spoke about the, you can see this in his videos, any time he spoke about these things, any time he was in front of a, a, a camera or a group, the, the, it, it, was, it was such an emotional thing to see. His tears in his eyes, it was tearing him apart, literally tearing him apart. He was a lawyer, and it's, it's the same for all of us, tearing us apart. And, he, and Lefebvre was a loyal son of the church, one of the greatest missionaries of the 20th century, a favorite of Pope Pius XII. He wasn't a renegade. He didn't want to go against the Vatican. He never in a million years saw himself in, a, in a, the ridiculous position of being against the Pope, the Vatican. And so he gives us this wonderful way of resisting as well, to stay in the church, continue to fight, and recognize that we're in a crisis state and crisis hits, you need to take emergency measures, which is what he did. I'm fully convinced, absolutely agree with you. Society at some point is going to be back in the church and Archbishop Lefebvre is going to be the Athanasius of our time and he will be canonized as such. So the beginning, Miss Matt, you said that this is the beginning of a long process. Now, we, we may be seeing the twilight of the Francis Pontificate. We've got the Synod of Synodality happening. Can you tell us any more about the long-term process of this? We've been in it for a long, long time. And that's something we all have to get used to, got to dig in. And that's why I think I started this conference off by saying, as somebody who's been a traditional Catholic all my life, 
and, and was in the catacombs literally for mass for a number of years, went to the Eastern Rite for a time to survive. Uh, we are in a better situation now. The clarity is, is, is so much better that we have bishops, we have cardinals who are seeing what's going on. And that's a very important element of it. I think there's a long row to hoe here. We've got a long way to go. And like the Japanese, like Father Onoda last night was give us that, that wonderful example, no matter what happens to the Mass, no matter what happens, we need to dig in and get ready to keep the faith, and that's going to be tough, but we have to do it. You can never, ever step away from Mother Church. And then just as a scrappy sort of aside, on my part, maybe I shouldn't say this, but it just seems to me that if you look at that absurd Crayola drawing Synod on synodality, goofy, phony, baloney, plastic, banana, garbage that they're cranking out now and expecting to take that seriously. If we can't take that nonsense out, it's on us. It really is. So how does that work? You make a mockery of it. Everywhere you go, you talk about the synod for the mockery that it is. I've done a lot of work on this. When I see these guys, poor bishops, trying to say how important it is to listen and everything, it's, it's, it's humiliating. I would say it's like Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, but that's an insult to Fred Rogers at the end of the day. They cannot possibly be serious. So I think a practical application of how we deal with synodality is to make fun of it. At, 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 at every juncture, with the mailman, with the pre, everybody. Get everybody laughing about this thing. It's so stupid. And then secondly, maybe a little tiny bit more, with a little more reverence, would be to point out to people, because somebody's got to succeed Pope Francis. Right now, Pope Francis is the least popular pope in history. I really believe that. If you're talking about practicing Catholics, no. I used to, as, a, as the editor of a bomb-throwing radical traditional Catholic magazine, I used to have to, everywhere I went, kind of be defensive and explain. You know, the now I find everywhere I go, people are trying to prove their tratty cred to me. It's bizarre. <laughs> and, 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 and that's what's happening. So it seems to me that if you look at Francis, um, what's happening to him in terms of popularity, the, the, the man that succeeds him, just humanly speaking, might actually not want to be Francis II because nobody really likes what he's doing. So I think that we, the, the more outspoken we are, the more that, the, that our neighbors, Protestant, Catholic, whatever, realize that Catholics are fed up with what's happening right now with this spectacle, the better the chance might be that we influence, that this is a, a, lay, a lay way of, of exercising or exerting some influence, that even the next pope might think, we, maybe we shouldn't be pushing this much further. The people are done with this. That's just a human, right? A kind of a human sensibility that any, any man who would, would go to the chair, send to the chair of St. Peter might be uh, susceptible to. So I think that's what, by long haul, I think we have to come up with a bunch of uh, strategies, some of which are, are, are probably not as effective as others, but get ready for the long haul. Join, get together, meet like this, put our heads together to make sure. This conference might not happen next year. I mean, things are going so crazy. I don't know any, any one of us knows. I and mean, we're talking about friends of John Henry Weston get, getting arrested. We've all met people and known people who are now in jail over the January 6th thing for no reason. So we don't know. So we have to use the time that we have right now to make sure we get the strategy right, we stay together. So no matter where we end up, whether we're with Cardinals, Cardinal Zen or, or, or we're left alone for a time, we remember this. We remember each other. Like we're going to hold our, our end of it and one day we'll meet, hopefully, in a better time. If not, then merrily in heaven, as St. Thomas More said. But we got to get ready to, to, to stick together for the long haul. Good. I think we can wrap up. I think if anybody has any other questions here, that's thank you very much, press and press on, on the live stream for being with us. Let's go have a drink. Thank <laughs> you.